Hello, and welcome to the National Endowment for Democracy this evening. Thank you for spending this beautiful first evening of spring with us. Uh, my name is Don Podesta, and I'm with the Center for International Media Assistance here at the NED. Uh, we at the Center are very pleased to co-sponsor this event with the NED's uh, International Forum for Democratic Studies, whose uh, executive director, Chris Walker, will be moderating our discussion today. Uh, Chris will introduce our panelists, and we'll have more to say about the work of our featured speaker, Emily Parker, author of Now I Know Who My Comrades Are, Voices from the Internet Underground. But I just want to take a moment to say how timely and important this work is. It, it traces the increasing role of the blogosphere and social media in giving citizens and dissidents in authoritarian countries voice, a uh, platform to organize, and means to support each other, all very important to the NED's mission. So we're happy to have you here, Emily. Thank you. The book is available in the back for sale if you would like to pick up a copy. Uh, and lastly, just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, for those of you on Twitter, you can follow this presentation and contribute to the conversation by using the hashtag NetEvents, uh, or by following the forum at Think Democracy, the endowment at, at Ned Democracy, and SEMA at, at SEMA underscore media. Uh, and if you haven't yet silenced your mobile phones, this might be a good time to do it, if you please. Um, with that, thank you again all for coming. And I'm sure we're going to have a lively discussion. Over to you, Chris. Thank you very much, uh, Don. Thank you very much, Don, for the introduction. And uh, it's really a pleasure to have Emily and Christian here with us today. Uh, I just say right at the outset, we're, we're planning to do this as a conversation. We'll have an opportunity to hear from uh, Emily. We'll have comments from uh, Christian. And then we'll leave adequate time for questions from the audience. Uh, I'll just do a brief introduction of both of the panelists that are here today. And then we'll, we'll get right into it. So as Don mentioned, Emily Parker has written this terrific book that we're here to talk about today. Uh, Emily is currently the Digital Diplomacy Advisor and Future Tense Fellow at the New America Foundation. She's also founder of Code for Country, a first open government coding marathon between the United States and Russia that brought together Russian and American software developers to identify technological solutions to challenges of government transparency. Parker previously served as a member of Secretary Clinton's policy planning staff at the U.S. Department of State, where she covered 21st century statecraft issues, innovation, and technology. Before joining the State Department, she was a staff writer and editor at the Wall Street Journal in Hong Kong and New York Journal. That's impressive. From 2004 to 2006, she wrote a Wall Street Journal column entitled Virtual Possibilities, China and the Internet. She's a former global policy fellow at the Carnegie Moscow Center, where she researched the role of blogging and social media in Russia. Her work has appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Slate, Newsweek, Foreign Policy, The New Republic, the Far Eastern Economic Review, Project Syndicate, and World Affairs. A brief word about Christian Carl, who is a senior fellow at the Legatum Institute and a contributing editor at Foreign Policy Magazine, where he edits the terrific Democracy Lab. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, I encourage you to have a look. Democracy Lab is a special online venture of the Legatum Institute in foreign policy devoted to countries aspiring to make the transition from authoritarianism to democracy. He's also a senior fellow at the Center for International Studies at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books. From 2000 to 2004, he served as Newsweek's Moscow bureau chief and later headed its Tokyo bureau. Carl has contributed to numerous publications, including the Wall Street Journal, The New Republic, The Spectator, and Der Spiegel. He was a winner of the 2011 Overseas Press Club Award for Best Online Commentary, a member of Newsweek reporting team that won a 2004 magazine award from reporting in Iraq and a 1999 finalist in the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists Award for Outstanding Investigative Reporting. And also know Christian uh, wrote a book that uh, was recently published called Strange Rebels, 1979 and the Birth of the 21st Century, which is also uh, well worth having a look at. And with that, um, I'd like to ask Emily to start just by giving a sense of uh, how you put the book together, sure. because you were in some uh, unusual places at unusual times, and you met some terrific people. Uh, I'd just be curious how much time it took you and perhaps your sense of what 
the most important part of the, uh, the work was to get it completed. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you so much to everyone for coming. This is a great crowd, some friends in the audience. So um, the short answer to your question is it took way too much time to, <laughs> to write this book. The book goes back to 2004. That's when it originated. So I was clearly doing other things during that time, but that's when I first got the idea for the book. And I'll just tell the story of that, which will kind of open it out a little bit. So in 2004, I was in Hong Kong working for the Wall Street Journal. And at the time, we were talking about doing a column about China and the internet. And what's funny about this is, is in 2004, it wasn't clear that China and the internet was going to be a major important story. I know that sounds crazy now because China and the internet is clearly a global story. Back then, it seemed almost like a niche, techy story that maybe nobody would, would, would be particularly interested in. And you know, the dynamic back then wasn't that different from what it is now. China had a very extensive censorship mechanism. There was you know, the Great Firewall of China, which we all know about. There were armies of human censors. There were automatic filtered keywords. Yet at the same time, there were people who managed to get around those controls and spread information. So what the Wall Street Journal wanted me to do was to kind of look at how people were doing that. And I thought to myself, OK, that's interesting, sort of. But is it, is it, does it really matter if you have a few thousand Chinese people getting around censorship if you know, this censorship is so effective for the most part. So I went to Beijing in 2004 to kind of try to find some answers to that question. And it, it was only when I started talking to some of the Chinese netizens on the ground that I began to feel like there was really a story here. And so the title of this book comes from a conversation that I had with a Chinese blogger named Michael Anti. I'm sure many of you know him. He, um, in 2004, and I asked him, you know, why does the internet matter in China? And he said, I thought, okay, this, this is a big story, and this is something that's really going to change the way things work in authoritarian countries. And to explain what that phrase means, you know, we tend to talk about the internet a lot in terms of freedom of speech and freedom of information. It's, you know, these people spread some, some news, they shared some information, and they got past the censors. The truth is, is that's, in my view, not what's most important about the internet. What's important about the internet is, is it its ability to facilitate freedom of assembly, even freedom of virtual assembly, in countries like China. So you look at a country like China, where you know since 1989, since the Tiananmen uh, protests that swept throughout the country, China has basically said, this will never happen again. We will never be blindsided by these kinds of protests again. And as a result, any group, any group or gathering of individuals that the government distrusts will be cracked down upon very, very hard. I mean, this is kind of one of the greatest realities of China. So it's no small event that given that situation, there are hundreds or thousands or millions of Chinese gathering online. And I think that's what Michael Anti meant when he said that phrase. And his story, and the book opens with his story, which is, um, you know, Michael Anti, for some, any of you who know him now, he's like one of China's more well-known, outspoken, dissident bloggers. But he grew up being a firm supporter of the Communist Party. I mean, he was a true believer. And, you know, I quote extensively from his diaries when he was a kid. I mean, he really, he really believed in this. And he believed everything he saw on television and everything he read in the newspapers. And so when the Tiananmen protests were happening in 1989, he just completely thought the government version of the story was 100% accurate. He had no reason to doubt it. And the government version was, these are these counter-revolutionary violent rioters who are attacking soldiers. It was you know, pretty black and white. And he completely, he completely subscribed to that. Fast forward 10 years, he's sitting in a rented apartment with a friend. He goes online and finds um, in a dissident Web, a dissident newsletter from overseas. And this dissident newsletter shows a completely different version of what happened in Tiananmen Square. It shows you know, narratives, first person narratives from people who were there. It shows photographs of dead bodies. I mean, really graphic stuff. And, and kind of at that moment, his entire world basically collapses. And it sort of begins his path to descent. And I don't think he's the only one who, whose path to descent began that way in China. But again, what's most important about this is there was a time not so long ago where somebody in China would have a realization like that. And that would kind of be it. It's like, OK, I have this realization. I, I don't really relate to anyone around me, but what does it matter? But for someone like Antti, he found online there were all these people that shared his disillusionment and shared his views and shared his criticism. And that's, again, where the title comes from. It's now I know who my comrades are. It's not only am I a critic of the system, I also know that I'm not alone. 
and the time frame that uh, you undertook the project really over the last 10 years has seen um, kind of waves of uh, treatment for the Definitely. online community. So I'm just wondering in Michael Lanty's case and in the Chinese case, how you assess the um, response of the authorities to the sort of people who realize they could assemble and presumably even coordinate at some level and how you, how you view that looking from 2014. Yeah, so China is, it's a cliche, but it's true. It's a cat and mouse game. It's always been a cat and mouse game. And it's been a cat and mouse game from the beginning. So, you know, when there was a certain amount of people online, when there were a handful of people online, there was a commensurate amount of government response. And now there's hundreds of millions of Chinese online. There's more Chinese online than there are f people physically in the United States of America. I mean, these are the numbers we're talking about. And unsurprisingly, authorities have have fought back in equal measure so you know a, as the internet's power has grown so has the attempts of governments to rein it in that's that's been like a trend that i've seen going forward maybe we we'll bring christian into the conversation this battle um with the internet in this case being at the center of it of authoritarian regimes seeking to um, maintain some element of control for technology that doesn't always lend itself to that sort of easy control, say like television or radio. Right. From, from the sorts of things that uh, you look at in the, the work you're doing, what strikes you as most uh, critical in that regard? Well, I think, um, I think Emily, I have to give Emily a big compliment again because I think this is a very, very impressive book indeed. Um, one of the things that I like about it is that she does a great job of showing the power of the internet, but I also think she's very good at showing where the limits mm -hmm. lie, right? She's not sort of one of these, you know, in America, we love technology. If, if there's new technology, we think it's great. We embrace it. We think it's going to change the world. Um, technology, of course, has many sides, right? Every technology transforms the world in different ways, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Um, the strength of the internet as a political organizing medium is, of course, its distributive property, right? That there are so many people in so many different places who can easily communicate, who can find each other, and they can know who their comrades are. Um, but it also has a shadow side, which is that it actually enables government surveillance and tracking in ways that those other technologies you mentioned didn't. I was quite, I was actually quite impressed that even a fairly um, dunderheaded regime like President Yanukovych's could come up with a technique of, you know, sending an SMS to everybody on the on the square in Kiev saying, you're participating in an illegal demonstration, you know, leave or you will, you know, be sanctioned by the government. So obviously that's the dialectic here, right? Um, and, uh, you know, the internet does provide an, an amazing tool for people to assemble, as you said, uh, virtually and not. Uh, but it also opens up unlimited possibilities to governments as well. And I think, you know, in our enthusiasm for the medium, sometimes we forget that a little bit. So the challenge seems to be how do we capitalize on the distributive strengths of the Internet without, you know, making it easy for the for the bad guys. And I, uh, today, just by coincidence, Zainab Tufixi had mm -hmm. a, a, an op-ed in the New York <coughs> Times. And she was getting at some of the issues of the limitations of the internet, yes. both its potential and limitations. And perhaps this is simply a, a function of the way the internet has evolved and people's impressions and use of it has evolved. But what do you see as the uh, kind of next step for the people you engaged and interviewed in the book, even someone like Alexei Navalny, mm -hmm. uh, for how he'll be able to use this in the face of these increasing obstacles that are being placed in his way. Well, after Navalny's op-ed in the Times today, I don't think. <laughs> Alexei Navalny, for people who are not following, is, is Russia's most prominent opposition blogger who's been under house arrest and barred from the internet, and yet his supporters and his wife are constantly tweeting and blogging on his behalf. And today, he had an op-ed in the New York Times, which was basically called How to Punish Putin. So I don't think that, I don't think the immediate future is going to be very good for him <laughs> after that. But, you know, so I agree with everything you, both of you are saying. And, and it's funny, the debate about the Internet authoritarianism, I feel like, has gotten a little bit almost warped over the past few years, where you almost have to say, I'm on this side, I'm on the Internet yeah. side, or I'm on the authoritarian side. And I get this question all the time, well, who's winning? Are you a techno-utopian, or are you this? Or, and 
I don't think I'm any of those things. Like, I think if anything, this book is, shows some of the positive sides of the internet. But you know, for anyone who's read it, they'll also know that this book is filled with surveillance and intimidation and harassment and censorship and blocking and, and arrests. I mean, this is not a rosy view. I mean, el everyone in this book deals with really big obstacles. And so I don't want to paint some fake vision of what the internet does in these countries. But what I really try to do with this book is show an element of the internet that I think is less talked about, which is the psychological impact in authoritarian countries. And I just don't think we talk about that enough. I think we talk a lot about the internet and authoritarianism with these very abstract concepts, like the people versus the government versus the state versus the netizens. It's like, what did all those things even mean? And so one of the, th one of the, the themes that I, I looked at in this book is, the psychological elements that keep authoritarian regimes in power. Because the truth is, is that most authoritarian countries would not be able to, su to survive a sustained mass uprising. The other truth is that most authoritarian regimes don't ever have to face that reality. And, and it's not because of military force necessarily. It's not, it's often, it, there are certain psychological elements that keep authoritarian regimes in power. And the three that I focus on in this book are isolation, which is basically dissenters are isolated from one another. So one person goes outside and screams, I hate the regime, it's not going to do anything. 10,000 do that, and it's a threat, right? And, and I think a country like China knows that extremely well. They say, OK, it's a, you know, because you can say critical things in China. It's not like you can't say those things. What, the, where the party's bottom line is, is collective action. You know, it's like, OK, you want to go on Weibo and insult this official? That's not such a big deal. But if you want to go on Weibo and say, all right, 100 of you, come meet me in the square, that's a huge deal. And you could go to, to jail for that. So isolation is the first one. Second one is fear. This is very simple, right? If you're afraid of dissent, if you're afraid of your fellow citizens, if you're afraid to speak openly to people around you, if you're paranoid, you're not going to band together in protest. And Cuba, my section on Cuba really focuses on fear. Fear is a really big part of Cuban life. It's not always clear what people are even afraid of, but there, there's a lot of paranoia in that society. And that is a really effective weapon of the, of the Cuban government. They don't even need to do anything anymore. People are just afraid. And then the third uh, psychological element is apathy. And apathy is kind of like when fear and isolation have already done their damage, and people are like, you know, why protest? Because there's no point. There's just no point. Nothing is going to change anyway. There's going to be 30 of us on the street. You know, we're all going to get arrested, and it's not going to change the government. So it's better for me to just kind of like stick to my house, go to work, go home, watch TV. It's just not worth it. And I think in Russia, until fairly recently, that was sort of the dominant narrative. You know, when I went to Russia in 2010 to start researching this book, the internet was fairly free. You could actually, I mean, it wasn't like China at all. You could really find most information, and you could say mm -hmm. most things. And a journalist put it to me quite, quite succinctly. She said, in Russia, you can search for any information. The problem is people don't search for it. Right? It was the idea like, OK, fine, you can find all these pictures of Putin, and you can find all this opposition, these opposition blogs, but it's not going to change anything in this country. We have no power. So isolation, fear, and apathy. And what I've observed is that in countries like China, Cuba, and Russia, the internet has been very effective in helping people get over these obstacles. So take isolation, for example. It's this idea that you're alone. Right? If you feel like you're alone, you're not gonna you're not gonna protest, right? And so in China, I think this idea that people know who their comrades are and that they know that there's people who share in their criticism is like really transformative. It's a really big deal. And people say, well, they're not in the streets yet. It's like, okay, no, they're not. But like, let's take things one thing at a time. I think, you know, this idea that people feel that they're not alone. And you look at someone like Michael Anti, who, you know, he has there's even in China, which is essentially a one-party state, you almost have these multi-party system online, right? You have right and then you have left and then you have Democrats and then liberals. Like even the people who oppose the party in China have their own mini parties, you know, because there's people who think, okay, we need to work within the system and make the system better. And then there's people who think we need to overthrow the system. And there's all these debates happening and it's, it's quite an amazing thing. And then you look at something like fear. So Cuba, you know, Cuba is the second section of this book. And there's hardly any bloggers in Cuba. Cuba has very limited internet penetration. However, the bloggers that I've met there are very different from everyone around them. And I think in the, on the most basic level, they've overcome a lot of the fear that people suffer. And, and there's several reasons for this. I think on the most basic level, 
you know, Cubans who write blogs, they feel like that's the one place that they found where they can actually like say what they really think. It's very hard to do that in Cuba. It's hard to kind of speak openly. And they just kind of, they've sort of found their voice. And it sounds a little trite, but it's true. And I think for some of them, it was a transformative experience saying, okay, I'm going to actually say what I think and I'm not going to pretend to be somebody else. And then also, you know, there's the kind of protection that comes with fame. You know, and, and a lot of people ask me when I was writing about Cuban bloggers, like, oh, aren't they afraid to be in this book? And for the most part, it was the opposite. For the most part, they welcomed the publicity because in Cuba, anonymity is really dangerous. And, you know, for a lot, like for a lot of these bloggers, you know, I, I tell the story of a blogger who got arrested for something she wrote online. You know, 10 years ago, that would have been it. Nobody would have known. She would have gone somewhere, and we never would have known about it. But she was in the blogger network. And people wrote about it and got kind of the attention of human rights organizations and, and people in the Cuban exile community. And I think the Cuban authorities figured, like, you know what, this just isn't worth it. It's not worth it. This is too much trouble for us. And of course, that's not always going to happen. But I think the bloggers in Cuba do feel this sense that they're not alone. They're not totally isolated. And then, you know, the third thing, apathy. I think Russia is a fascinating case study, and we can get more into Russia because there's so much stuff happening there now. But Russia is a country where, again, the internet was there. It was totally, almost totally free, not completely, but pretty free, much freer than you would expect. And it wasn't doing anything. It wasn't, it wasn't like creating this kind of political dissent that people had hoped for. And um, over the years, we started to, we've started to see these incremental changes. And I think, you know, Alexei Navalny is a really interesting example because what he did was he showed Russians via the internet that they could make a difference. You know, I think the big reason for Russian apathy is people thought we can't change anything. I mean, you look at Russia, right? I mean, there's so much corruption. There's these like incredibly powerful companies. Nobody knows what they're up to. You know, I mean, an, an ordinary citizen in Russia, like what could you possibly do? And what Navalny did was he, kind of got ordinary Russians to take on these big companies. You know, he would gather people, and he took, he took on very fightable battles. You know, like everyone signed this online petition to get this one specific person to resign. Or sometimes it was even simpler than that. He would say, let's all, let's all fight to get road regulations better. So take a photo of the pothole in front of your house and we'll report it. And he was doing this for years and years, and he kind of started bringing these small successes. And success is the best antidote to, to apathy. I think Russians were like, oh, we can actually do something here. And, and um, yeah, so, so that's, that's sort of what I'm focusing on. So what's next? You know, the other question that I'm sure somebody will ask at some point is, well, will the internet cause a revolution in these countries? And again, I don't think that's the right question. So the internet doesn't cause revolution anywhere. Other things caused revolution. The internet didn't cause the Arab Spring, didn't cause the Russian protests. It played a really important role, definitely, but it doesn't cause these revolutions. What causes revolution is, you know, a political crisis, an economic crisis, you know, something else. There has to be a spark for a revolution to happen. But once that spark is lit, then the internet can play a really, really important role. And so in Russia, you know, in 2010 in Russia, I went to a protest, there were 80 people or something. You know, a year later, there were 100,000 people. And those people used online tools to organize. But, you know, you have to just get the cause and effect in the right order. At that point, there was like a m critical mass that was frustrated with electoral fraud, and they all kind of came to the streets. And once, there were, once they were ready to do that, you know, some guys, and they, they made a Facebook page and, you know, got tens of thousands of Russians out. So the internet did play an important role, but it was only when Russians were ready to do that. And I think that's kind of what we'll, we'll see going forward. You mentioned the Russia case, and you suggested that at least um, in some way the sharing of information and connecting with others can raise consciousness mm -hmm. in some Definitely. fashion. It's interesting. A colleague uh, mentioned to me in the Russia instance that today you can find graphic photos in the same way that you can find the photos of Yanukovych's riches for all sorts of Russian leaders. It's already out there. Oh, it was, it was already out there. I mean, there were crazy things. Like, you could go online. What's amazing about Russia is that they were, only, they were kind of transparent about their government. They, you could actually find a lot of information about procurement spending online. Like, for example, and if you looked at it, you would find these crazy things. Like, some officials bought golden beds. Literally, they bought beds that were, like, I don't know, had gold on them. And then, you know, at one point, there was some, someone had a party, and they ordered drummers from Burundi. Like, this kind of, and, then, like, this was happening. I mean, it was really 
like there was really no way to explain these expenses <laughs> and they were right on the internet and, and that was the whole thing it's like people could see them but what would be the point right so I mean what would you do with that information it was like there was no mechanism for using that information in a way that would make a difference and that's why Navalny is where he is because Navalny was the first person who said look at what is right here I mean you know people always talk about Navalny like he's Assange and he's not at all he was using publicly available information that just nobody bothered to take advantage of so it's not the information as such being out there, but it's having... It's the willingness to use it. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to say, again, I agree completely with all of that. Um, I just also have to say that another thing we always have to keep in mind about the Internet, like any other technology, is that it is actually, to an extent, value neutral. Yeah. So absolutely. it can help the Democrats. It can help the anti-authoritarians, the corruption fighters. It can also empower very nasty people. Absolutely. And in China, for example, a lot of the... Um, the internet discourse that I get to see with my complete lack of any knowledge of Chinese is sometimes very ultra-nationalist to an extent that is extremely scary. Totally. To talk about Russian political apathy, I have never seen such political activism from Russians as I have in the past few days. The only problem is it's very bad activism. Mm -hmm. It's extremely nationalist. All of my liberal friends in Russia are sending me videos talking about how fascist the Ukrainian opposition is. Um, they're doing little, you know, gifs with Putin doing something heroic or dressing him up in uniforms. And I mean, it's a very, you know, you'd think it was a very positive thing because they're all so happy. But it's a very ominous yeah. kind of happiness. It's sort of, you know, the happiness of those crowds doing this in the 1930s, if I may be so crude. Um, and of course, the internet also allows those people to find their absolutely. Comrades. It does. It does absolutely. I wouldn't argue with that at all. And yeah. you know, I mean, this book focuses more on pro-democracy movements, but that is, I mean, that is true, and it's true in this country too. I mean, all sorts of nasty exactly. groups. And I mean, I guess the only thing, the only bright side of that is like, look, at least it's not monolithic, right? I mean, at least you know, at least you have these different groups. And and you know, I think it, it, w without without the internet, you could have a situation in which you really only had one dominant narrative, and at least like different groups are allowed to exist, good ones, bad ones, but. Yeah, that's that's a real that's part of the story, sure. especially nationalism. And in the diverse places you were in, and these very different personalities you met, were there any common features you detected across the antis and the divergence and the? Yeah, definitely. So you know, one one of the people sometimes say, "Why are these three countries in your book? You know, China, Cuba, and Russia." I mean, on the most basic level. I was interested in the communist and post-communist world. It's very different. I mean, we talk a lot about the Middle East and Egypt and Tunisia, and like th that's just a different setting. I mean, China, Cuba, and Russia are super different, obviously, but you know, they come from that same background and sometimes that communist language. You know, you kind of hear, you know, even in Russia, because some of the people in my book are older and lived through the Soviet Union, you know, they kind of grew up, they were young pioneers, you know, and there's something about the communist way of, I don't know, just the communist way of talking it's this idea that like you know you're part of this big entity and it doesn't really doesn't really value individualism very much and it's you know this idea like you're part of the you know they're people the people with a capital p and and that's something that i kind of i've heard versions of that in all three of these countries it's like you know they grew up with this narrative about like being part of this like larger march toward you know history and being part of the this abstract concept of the people and like you know the internet was the one place where they were able to find their individual voices and their individual individuality because communism is not super into individualism <laughs> so I think that, I think that's probably like one of the larger things and then you know there's and just again just the concept of now I know who my comrades are I really feel like I heard almost every blogger say some version of that you know and not not that exact phrase but some version of like now I know I'm not alone or like you know in, in Russia in Russia, you know, in 2011, 2012, when the people came out to the streets, you know, a lot of the Rus a lot of Russians would sit, like look around and see all these people and say like, "Wow, we exist. There's a lot of us." You know, like just this versions of that and this idea that like I thought I was alone, but now I'm not. I've heard that over and over again, and and that's why I wanted to do more than one country because you know I come from a China background, but I didn't want this to be a China book because then it would be like just a China story, and this isn't a China story. This is like a much bigger story, I think. And is uh, Russia post-communist? I mean, I, I, I don't know about now, but yeah. <laughs> Just <laughs> yeah. checking. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the Soviet Union was over last time I checked, but yeah. <laughs> so, yes, in fee, yes, technically. I, I just wanted to ask, you know, there's this critique of, uh, of the Internet as a political organizing tool. Mm. You know, the idea that what, what Internet discourse promotes is weak social ties, yeah, yeah. right? 
and then you know maybe if you're lucky other things will happen and you'll get some kind of political critical mind. I'd love to hear your response to that yeah, I don't skeptical know. I just, argument. Well the weird the thing about the weak social ties is, I, don't, I don't I don't I I don't quite get that argument. I mean I the, the thing to remember is that the internet always it reflects the reality on the ground. It doesn't create a new reality, right? And so the weak social ties I mean what is that I, I'm I don't even know what that even means. I mean, can you explain to me? I, I've read, I know, I know the commentary, but what is it? I think basically you can boil it down to saying it's easy to sit on the web and and chat about stuff and right. and just you know jaw jaw, but acting is something different. You know, well, I, think, I that, think that's the yeah, version of the argument. I think that goes back to sort of to the earlier point. And someone said this to me in Russia. I think he was paraphrasing Lenin, um, which is. For a revolution, you need a revolutionary situation, right? So it goes back to the like, you know, it's it, will social media create revolution? But Russia is, a, you know, the, the, I guess what the the weak ties thing is kind of this argument. Well, the opposition is only virtual. You know, you hear that a lot. It's only virtual. Right. And, and can I just say that, like, literally, I think it was a month or something before uh, the Arab Spring, before the Egyptian Revolution, there was an article, you know, on one of the wires that said, you know online dissent has yet to go from the homes to the streets. I mean, that was that was the dominant narrative in Egypt. If you had said to someone two weeks before the Arab Spring, the internet's going to be a game changer in this country, I mean, nobody would have taken you seriously at all. So it's like the reality looks static until it's not. And I think in Russia, you know, Russia, again, it was like, oh, here's this online virtual playground where everybody is, you know, everybody's just doing their thing. And I think 2011 and 2012 really proved that wrong. But you have to get the right, you have to get the moment right. It had, the moment has to arise. And here's, here's where the internet, here's another place where the internet is quite important in organizing protests. So again, will the internet create spontaneous protests? No. But you look at Russia. And again, I went to a, you know, I went to a protest in 2010 with 100 people and like a million police. And it was very clear, okay, this is why no one bothers protesting in this country. What is the point? Fast forward to you know 2011, someone puts up a Facebook page to tell people where the big protest is going to be, and you know an ordinary Russian would would previously think, okay, if I go to this protest, there's going to be 10 other people there, I'm not going to bother. Then they look on Facebook, and there's 30, 33,000 people signed up for the protest. You know that's going to change your mindset, right? That's going to change your mindset in that, okay, if I go to that protest, there's going to be tens of thousands of other people there, and it's not going to be totally pointless. I think the other dimension of uh, Christian's question, which you address in, mm. in the book in some way, but I think it's also connected to uh, Zainab Turkface's mm. op-ed is that um, the nature of the organizing that occurs online doesn't forge the same sort of um, yeah. relationships. And my colleague Nadia Duke has made this observation about the pre-1989 mobilization where people were required to interact together um, physically to figure out ways to publish Samizdat, to work hard to organize um, in ways that required real courage beyond um, I'm exaggerating the point, but beyond simply using a mouse or a, a, a keypad uh, in the organizational phase, and it took years to build those sort of relationships. And in order to have a little more durability yeah. beyond the protest movements, absolutely, that, that would be the maybe the, the additional distinction that people are raising now. Definitely, and I, you know, Zainab, I, I, I really respect her work, and I think we're totally on the same page here. Um, you know, when it comes to the role of the internet in organizing protest movements, it is a double-edged sword, right? And, and I think we saw that in Egypt. It's, you know, everyone talks about Egypt as being the leaderless revolution, because that's the benefit of social media revolutions, is that there's no leader. And, you know, Zainab, I think, always talks about it being like whack-a-mole. You know, it's really hard to cut off the head of someone when there is no someone. I mean, there's it's all over the place. And in Russia, we saw that too. There were social media sites in like 80 different cities, you know, and, and it's, it's very decentralized. And that's very effective for taking down an authoritarian regime, because they don't know it. They're not, they're not, they don't know how to deal with that. They don't have a strategy for that. They know how to find the one guy and put him in jail. They don't know how to deal with these sort of decentralized webs of, of protest. So that's very effective for taking down, you know, a government. However, the downside of a leaderless revolution is that there are no leaders, you know, and that's something that we're seeing, I think, in Egypt. And that's a point that, you know, Zainab makes quite well is that, you know, once the revolution is over, you know, these are people who are not, um, they don't know, they don't have a strategy necessarily for the future. They have no organization, they have no plan. So that's true. I totally agree with her. But the other thing that I want to say, and I guess this comes to the weak ties thing too, 
it's not all about protest movements, though. You know, right. I think I think that's the other thing. It's like, you know, and I get this question all the time. Well, it's like, well, will the Internet lead to revolution or not? Will the Internet cause protests or not? But there's ways to transform a country in the absence of a revolution and in the absence of widespread protest. And I think China is a good example of this. I mean, China, if you ask the average Chinese person, no one's saying, like, when are we going to have our revolution? I mean, that's not what they're aiming for. But I don't think you could argue that the Internet has not transformed China nonetheless. You know, I mean, people are using the Internet in China to fight for greater transparency, to fight for greater accountability. It is a revolutionary force. It's just not an actual like revolution, you know? So that's where the whole weak ties thing, it's like that's only, that argument is only applicable, I think, in like a protest scenario. But, you know, these, the internet is sort of creating individuals that just wouldn't have existed before. I mean, you look again at Navalny. Navalny is a, it's fundamentally a creature of the internet. He is now the most prominent opposition figure in Russia. He's probably the only viable individual threat to Putin. I mean, if he manages to stay alive. And he is, he made his fame on the internet. He was completely barred from television, barred from newspapers. He rose to fame 100% on his blog. That's really something. I mean, this guy exists because of the internet. And, and there's people like that in all these countries. And so sometimes I just think we overstate the importance of protests specifically. And, and I also think that the Russians, for example, are looking at Egypt and they're thinking like, we don't really want that necessarily. Like they don't want, I mean, you look at Egypt right now, it's not an enviable situation. I mean, you look at Egypt and you think, okay, this place has a lot, this is a long way to go. And, you know, the Russians, for example, like even they're operating kind of as in an underdog position, they're learning how to fundraise online. They're learning how to run a political campaign. Navalny ran for mayor, got almost 30% of the vote in Moscow, which is actually, it doesn't seem like a lot, but it's stunning, again, considering that he only exists on the internet, pretty much. You know, he, they, and, and his followers were very smart. They learned, how, they know that they're mostly online. They know that they're mostly Moscow. So they use their online ability, for example, to get people to print out pamphlets and deliver them to other people. Like, they understood how to kind of bridge the gap between virtual and real. The other thing the Russian opposition did, which I think was very impressive, is they held an online election amongst themselves, you know, to kind of develop a hierarchy within the, the opposition. And, you know, there were flaws and there were problems and bots and all the usual Russian things. But it was still, it was still a really impressive effort. And I think they're trying to, to, to kind of counteract that notion that like this has to, this is a chaotic free for all of Facebook revolutions. I mean, they're trying to actually use their online capacity to, to build a solid base. I think we'll move to um, questions in just a moment. Christian, do you want to add anything else at this point? No, that's your question. Okay. If um, you'd kindly give your name and affiliation, we can do that. Why don't we start with Louisa Griever right here? Thank you, Louisa Griva here at NED. Uh, I do believe the the cat using the internet should be noted also extends internationally mm -hmm. uh, because uh, being able to produce fear and isolation can extend to one's critics overseas. Mm -hmm. So all the, the Tibetans and the Uyghurs and so on, GhostNet, you know, if you know that your laptop camera can be turned on without your knowledge, it also um, inhibits you. So without the internet, all you had, if you're the Chinese regime, is you can deny visas um, and you can disrupt the UPR process, which they're doing this week in Geneva, um, but you, uh, now everybody sitting at their computer is also feeling um, pressure from the Chinese government, which it can only do because we're all on the internet mm. and so are they. Um, two questions, one is, what do you think of the decision of the US Department of Commerce to give away control of, of ICANN, does that have any impact? And secondly, are you translating the book into Chinese, Russian, and Spanish, and are you giving access to bloggers who would like to translate portions in advance of the book coming out in Chinese? Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Those are good questions. So for ICANN, I don't. I mean, this is going to sound like a lame response, but some of it does remain to be seen because there's a lot of questions about just like how this is going to actually play out. Um, I don't know. I'm not. Re I, I don't know if you have other views on that. I'm not reacting to it. Is is this is going to be a disaster automatically? I mean, you know, there's been some responses of people saying, "Oh, Russia and China are going to take over," and and you know, I think in theory. Look, the U.S. the U.S. brand image has taken a big hit, right? And I think that's part of the problem. It's you know the U.S. has a really serious brand problem when it comes to the internet. And I think what's happened with ICANN is the U.S. kind of making that admission, like, okay, we this needs to be more of a multi-stakeholder process. How it's actually going to play out, I I don't know. I guess, yeah, I guess it's just too it's too soon to say. I mean, I, I I'm not a hundred percent pessimistic, is is what I would say. Sorry, that's not. I don't know. Do what do you think? Do you think it's going to be a disaster? 
I guess what percentage pessimistic are you? I just I just don't know because we just don't know what it's going to look like. I mean, there's just not enough information. The Wall Street Journal editorial page, Gordon Covid, thinks it's a total disaster. Oh, a lot of people think it's a total disaster. Yeah, but I just I just want to I just don't know how it's going to play out. That's that's all. I I need more information to decide that it's a total disaster. And I know you've written on the subject of uh, China's export of censorship. That mm -hmm. was related to yeah. Louise's first. Uh, Observation. Yeah. I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah. So that I mean, that's a little bit different. That I mean, because you were talking about more of a technological thing. Like I, I did write an article that was looking at how even people outside of China are worried about what they say about China more because of self censorship. So actually, that's just to it's actually do, good to bring that up because when we talk about Chinese internet censorship, we do talk a lot about these technological things, but self censorship is actually quite an effective way of keeping online dissent in check because a lot of censorship in China isn't like some guy in a trench coat, you know, calling you on his phone and saying, take that off the internet. You know, it's you actually sitting there and thinking, well, should I use this word? Should I use this term? Should I, you know, post this blog? And then saying, you know what, it's probably too much trouble. I'm just not going to do it. That happens at the level of editors and that happens at the level of individuals. And so my article was about how I think sometimes that even extends to, to foreign journalists because China can wield the visas you know, it's a very powerful tool for them. You know, you think, well, if I write about this really kind of, I don't know, if I write about this really toxic topic, you know, maybe I won't be able to go back to China. Or for people who live in China, maybe I'll be thrown out. So. And we have questions. Uh, we can take maybe the cluster of questions here. Um, while we are talking here Could tonight, you write, introduce yourself? My name is Ricardo Lasso from Panama. While we are talking here in Venezuela, if this government drawn by the Cubans and extending to Ecuador, Bolivia, even Argentina, follows the same pattern of communist Cuba, if this government fail, it may fail in a few hours, will be because of the internet. Do, it's difficult for the American mind to understand the kind of censorship that we get in those countries. Mm -hmm. You have no television, no radio station, no newspaper, and if any, anybody of any importance representing any group dare to talk against today Maduro in, in Venezuela, mm. he will be called personally and threatened if not jailed or killed. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult to understand what is going on. Mm. But the, the, the control of the government is absolute. And this new weapon is the reason why they are persecuting everybody that seems to have a cellular phone yeah. or anything. They are killing people because feeling that this person has one of these things. Mm -hmm. Even journalists from the West cannot be in, in, in Venezuela today. They are thrown out. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Why don't we take the question here and then we can, yeah. Hi, um, I'm Anna Nockwitz from China Digital Times and I'm really excited about reading your book. I was wondering if you could comment on the crackdown last fall on Weibo, which is often shorthanded called China's Twitter, oh. and now the crackdown on WeChat. Is there, was there like a moment for freer speech on China that's now closing off or is this just part of a general pattern that you've seen? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question. I think that it's part of a general pattern. You know, I think this sort of goes back to what I said earlier, which is that you know, every step of the way, as the yeah, as Chinese internet kind of gained power, like the authorities would match it. So you know, with Weibo, it was kind of only a matter of time. You know, I mean, Weibo was just so big and so powerful, and I, I don't think Weibo is dead. I mean, some people are saying it's dead, but you know, they were kind of going after the big V. You know, the the big V verified VIP users and. Um, you know, frankly, if I was the Chinese government, I mean, I, you can see why, right? I mean, this is this is a country where they're very nervous about people about tools for collective action, and here you have one guy who can send a message to 40 million people on his mobile phone. You know, I mean, that's pretty dangerous. So it's it's not super surprising that that happened, and so now people are migrating 
to WeChat, and then of course there's censorship of that. So it's it's sort of you know I think with the whole Weibo thing, when when you know there's been the numbers in Weibo have decreased, and and people are attributing that to censorship. Although it's unclear how much of it is censorship and how much of it is just general internet trends, you know, moving from one thing to another. And there there's been some alarmism, like oh the authorities have won, they've killed Weibo, but. My, my feeling is like having seen this like, you know, that's the w one thing about looking at something for 10 years. I've seen all these like little kind of transitions like that, you know, and then when I first started writing this book, everyone was using BBS, you know, bulletin board systems. And then BBS were so lame, like only losers use BBS. We write blogs, you know, and then blogs like, oh my God, blogs are so 2006, you know, everyone's on micro blogs. And so it's always been like that in China and it's always been really trendy. And, you know, as far as, like, like the, you know, every time you switch to a new platform, there it has its own characteristics. Like, WeChat is going to, WeChat is going to be different from Weibo in terms of, like, how people communicate. But, like, the fundamental concept behind it and, like, how people use it and how they get around controls and the power of the internet in China, I don't think that story has changed all that much. Uh, good evening. My name is Jeffrey Harris. I'm an official of the European Parliament. I uh, have been working a lot on human rights, actually, in cooperation occasionally with the, the NED. Uh, just, just one anecdote which confirms what you said from the Arab revolutions and uh, then a question also about from that region. A few weeks before the, what you rightly said, unexpected revolution in Tunisia, I happened to be on holiday there and I had a dinner with a guy who'd been let out of jail after a big campaign in Europe. Uh, and we met for dinner and I said, well, thank you for coming. And he asked me about the, what I felt about the political situation in Tunisia. Of course, I didn't know that much. Uh, and he informed me the, that uh, the whole situation had changed. Due to Twitter and Facebook, people were no longer afraid and there was going to be a revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wouldn't say I was the first, but it was a very good example of how empowerment uh, broke the, the logjam, if you like. On the other hand, uh, another anecdote, because this whole question of the Twitter revolution, particularly in the Middle East, was discussed a great deal in the uh, Arab, uh, in, in the Egyptian scenario. Uh, but I was talking with um, American professors. Well, is it true that the revolution in Egypt was sparked by Twitter and Facebook? And he said, well, you could put it that way. Or you could say it was when the authorities closed down mm -hmm. uh, the internet in Cairo, uh, the activists were forced to go door to door. Uh, uh, and then that, then that really caused the revolution. And it's not really contradictory advice. But the question is, uh, literacy is not universal in the world, particularly mm -hmm. in the developing countries. Obviously, it must play a part if you happen to be have access and the ability to read and write on, on Facebook or Twitter, whether, whether you can participate in a revolutionary movement. So. Yeah, those are great points. Those are all really good points. And I definitely agree with your assessment of what happened in Egypt. I think you're, you're right on both points. I think that Twitter and fa you know, Facebook in particular did play an important role in kind of organizing, getting people onto the streets. But it was when the internet, when Q the Egyptians kind of tried to pull the plug on the internet that everybody, it, it kind of, the numbers dramatically increased. So that's a lesson, I think, for authoritarian governments, which is like, you know, sometimes that can have exactly the opposite effect of, of what you wanted. Um, and it will be interesting to see if something like that happens in Russia, because Russia now is really kind of trying to pull the plug on the internet a little bit. And, and um, a Turkey yeah, Turkey is another example. I mean, so 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 yes. Um, and your I'm sorry, your question was literacy. oh literacy. Yeah. So in terms of, I mean, the, I guess like the the I'm not an expert on on literacy and, and and internet movements, but what I would say is that you don't need like the entire country to organize a revolution, right? A lot of these these kind of uprisings do originate in the capital, you know, maybe among the elite, you know, that's, that's something that people say, oh, well, why are you just talking about Moscow? And it's true, like, the, I'm not saying the rest of the country doesn't matter, but, you know, often it is a smaller group of people that kind of lights the spark, and then, you know, and then it travels from the internet to word of mouth, and that's something that happened in Egypt as well. It kind of started with these online networks, but not every single person who was in the streets in Egypt was on Facebook. I mean, you had all sorts of people that probably had never, you know, been on Facebook in their life, but they heard about it from their neighbor or from their son or, you know, Know, so that kind of thing. So that's what I would say about that. I think it can spread in different ways. I guess the corollary to uh, this question of smaller groups being able to mobilize and having mm. in some ways outsized uh, impact relative to the rest of the population is that the regimes are finding ways to um, dissuade people who aren't kind of the advanced, courageous sort of people mm -hmm. that you've uh, 
uh, examined in the book to make them question whether they should push a little bit farther oh, yeah. online because mm -hmm. and I think the Chinese authorities are are just brilliant at doing this by either you know things as graphic as having these characters that walk across the screen saying you're violating yeah. something but then sending other signals and I wonder you know looking back over the last 10 years do you get the sense that the the concentric circles of people who would say you know what I'm going to push farther and I'm not going to be worried about saying certain things or self-censoring in, in, say, the China context, whether you see momentum heading in the right direction, mm -hmm. um, kind of outward from the Michael Antes, or whether there's more caution. Yeah, so Michael Ante is definitely, like, he's kind of an original, funny person. I mean, he doesn't represent at all, like, the average Chinese citizen. Um, but, you know, also, like, in my book does also have a lot of people who are much less remarkable than him, you know, who kind of, like, fell into this almost accidentally. Or even people who became accidental historical figures. Like, you look at, like, Wael Gonim, I think, is a good example. Wael Gonim is the one who organized a Facebook page in Egypt. He was just kind of you know, a tech guy. I mean, he's not a revolutionary leader. We did, we described him as such, but he was just kind of in the right place at the right time. And there's a, he has a corollary in Russia. So, you know, there are people who aren't, you know, as, I don't know, as remarkable who can still play these roles. Um, but, you know, in China, well, first of all, I would say that like Weibo and, and, and there's people in this room I know who follow Weibo very carefully, but, you know, Weibo is, is transforming kind of just like the type of discourse that you happen in China. I mean, Weibo has been described as like a public square. And, you know, a, a, some a Chinese um, activists that I talked to described it as like the transition from being sort of, you know, just like one of the abstracts, like one of the people to an actual citizen, you know? So I think there is sort of an, a, a kind of awareness that is coming to light on these, on these platforms of people just being like, you know, I'm going to, you know, complain about this and I have a right to talk about this and I'm going to complain about injustice and other people are going to defend me and I'm going to defend these other people. And, and, you know, I think there's like a different way of thinking that is sort of kind of mm -hmm. taking root. Um, yeah. So, so I, I think there's a different kinds of, a kind of consciousness that's happening online and, and, you know, among ordinary people. But the thing about China is that, you know, the thing that's important to remember about China is that if there's going to be some sort of like mass protest in China, it's not going to be for like, democracy probably you know it's not going to be for like free speech it's going to be because like some economic reason it's going to be you know i don't know it's going to be something more specific and and actually one of the bloggers in my book made a statement which is really interesting and kind of controversial but he said chinese people don't care about freedom they care about justice and it was a kind of a really provocative thing to say and i think what he meant <clears throat> was that if you look at a lot of online dissent in china or just not even dissent but just like online activity it's not people saying like we want freedom we want this they're not talking about these abstract concepts they're talking about you know this official in my in, in this place did this bad thing to my sister and why is there no justice? There's like these mini campaigns and where censorship comes into play there, it's like, well, this official beat my neighbor, why isn't he getting justice? And, and why aren't I allowed to talk about it? And if I can't talk about it, I can't get justice. So they're fighting in a slightly different way, but like they still are, you know, they still are demanding their rights. And my recollection is that there's parallels in Russia where this issue of justice or fairness comes yes. up. Yes. Where you have um, regional uh, political figures who are in car accidents mm -hmm. with ordinary citizens and it's really only when the online community puts it Absolutely, out that yeah. the authorities will take uh, some action. Could I just, um, I wanted to respond to the observation about Tunisia and Egypt. I think Tunisia and Egypt are indeed two magnificent examples of the role social media can play, but as Emily points out in the book, social media alone don't do it, right? right. So we also had uprisings in Correct me if I'm getting, if I'm missing some of them. We also had uprisings during the Arab Spring in Jordan, Morocco, mm -hmm. Kuwait, Bahrain, Syria. You know, yeah, point. and you know, the internet exists in all of those countries, so it 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 can play a very important role. But you know, up to a point. And I think one of the observations is that the internet has proven itself to be very influential for mobilizing against a repressive regime, but then coalescing around ideas that can offer something after that is, it's, far it's tricky. A, yeah it's very tricky and just two quick thoughts about the Arab Spring I agree with that hundred percent you know when we talk about a spark needed to kind of bring people into the streets I would say that in Egypt's case the spark was Tunisia right it was sort of like you know because you had all these people and it was building this anger was building online I mean you can some of it's very well documented but it wasn't until 
a neighboring government fell that was like, whoa, this is possible. You know, I think it was this feeling that like, yeah, we can argue all we want, but nothing's going to change. This guy's been in power for 30 years, you know, and then they saw Tunisia fall and you could really, you could see it. You could see it in in, in Egyptian internet commentary. was like, wait, maybe we can do that too. And I think that really was like, that was like the spark that kind of like pushed people over the edge. And if both of you are willing to to, uh, respond to this, I think the other dimension that uh, some observers of the Middle East and the North African uprisings have cited is the interaction between the internet and television, mm-hmm. especially Arabic language transnational yeah. television, kind of reinforcing each other, new narratives coming in ways they hadn't before. In Russia's case, you don't have, just using that example, mm. um, the sort of influential uh, parallel to um, Al Jazeera in yeah. the case of North Africa. That's true. And I'm just wondering whether there are um, observable limits to the sorts of things that a Navalny could achieve with his circle of uh, compatriots or comrades who have the same sort of ideas for having more justice. There is. I mean, Russia is really tough, and, and Navalny and his comrades are very aware of that. They're aware of the fact that they have been mostly operating in, with the online population. And Russia has a huge population that, I mean, still the vast majority of Russians get their information from television, vast majority. And television is, is, is really under the thumb of the state. And however, I will note that over the past three years, the number, the percentage of Russians that get their information from the internet has doubled. So it, 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 the numbers are changing, but the internet, the television still rules. Um, but, you know, again, I think Navalny and his people, I mean, they are so strategic about this. I mean, they really, they, they work with, you know, they have all these campaigns to kind of like get the internet, you know, get the online population to, you know, print out physical pamphlets and like bring them around. And so they're facing a bit of an uphill battle for sure, but they're working on it. And I think it's, and I think it's changing, but with Russia, it's not, it's again, it's not only about information. It's just about when Russians reach that boiling point. And that again, will probably be economic. And I think that Putin is economically quite vulnerable. I think that's, you know, pretty hard to argue. I don't know what's going to happen, but there's vulnerability there. And that's probably going to be the decisive point. It's not going to be Russians learning that something happened. It's going to be more like we just we're just mad about this and we don't want to take it anymore. And I think, frankly, you know, if you ask me, well, does the Internet matter in Russia? Well, if the Internet didn't matter in Russia, why are they trying so hard to crack down on it? I mean, I think that's the simplest answer. If this wasn't a threat at all, why are they spending so much time and energy and resources to to keep it in check? And given the stakes that are in play now, you're suggesting that the encroachments on the internet will be even sharper, I imagine. In the yeah, I think we're. I think this is just the beginning. You know, in Russia, I mean, there. You know, even over the past few weeks, you know, Navalny's blog was blocked. Opposition websites were blocked. Um, you know, who knows? Maybe they'll move on to Twitter and Facebook. That seems like a really silly thing to do, but I think it could definitely happen because that's what Russians are doing. They're saying, okay, fine, you block these websites. We're going to use Twitter. We're going to use Facebook. It's really, I think, you know, we could see that happen. And at the ownership level, they're moving Kremlin-friendly yep. owners into the... Oh, yeah, right. So it's the internet is just kind of the final frontier. I mean, you know, they've been... Cra- First, they took television, then they went to the newspapers, then they went to the online newspapers, then they went to the bloggers. So it's all kind of part of a larger narrative. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I, I think that was a very good observation about, um, you know, we, we we often neglect the role in this whole fabric of information and media, of, of traditional TV, of satellite, of satellite TV especially, has played an absolutely transformational role in the Arab-speaking world. And when you talk with Arab speakers, it's something they always remark. Some of them will say, well, I don't think the internet is so important. I think, you know, what's really important is satellite TV. Mm-hmm. And of course, we also, as you pointed out, right, it doesn't always have to be about politics either. Yeah. Certainly one of the most transformative things about satellite TV in the Arab-speaking world has been uh, kind of different views of the world. I mean, it's hard to imagine just how shuttered some of these countries were before, and now they're getting, you know, I mean, forgive me for sounding trivial, but now they're giving, they're getting, uh, you know, American sitcoms, and they're getting Lebanese music videos. Um, and in some places, I've seen this with my own eyes, that can be actually quite transformational. I, yeah, you, you hear about that. Yeah. I mean, this is not a great example of, you know, but you hear about it even in North Korea, right? You know, these South Korean... No, some, it's huge. You know, South Korean <clears throat> television sometimes gets into North Korea. And what's so revolutionary about those South Korean shows, sometimes it's just like the refrigerator in the background that's full of food. Or you so know? many yeah. cars on the street. Yeah, that's yeah, one of the no, things the North Koreans always things, say. They'll say, how yeah. did they get all those... Those must have taken all the cars in South Korea and put them <laughs> on that street. And you say, actually, no, it's just an ordinary street. Right, like they're not like revolutionary shows at all. They're just normal sitcoms, but 
but there's something about it that that can have a trigger. So. And you were going to. And I was just going to add that yes, that is a big problem within the Russian speaking space because um, there isn't the same kind of presence of an alternative view. And in fact, this is something um, over the past few weeks that has really bothered me a lot about the Crimean crisis. That you know, I'm talking to corresponding with a lot of Russians, and they just really are not getting any alternative mm -hmm. viewpoints there in this kind of Orwellian alternate universe. And, uh, you know, I think the rest of the world should be doing something more active to crack that. Well, Egypt is another example in the sense that yes. even the, uh, the transnational broadcasts, I don't believe they've been entirely uh, shut out, but, of course, there, there's enormous work being done right. to limit uh, the alternative ideas and voices that are in there. And, it's, and cracking guess, down on Al Jazeera journalists tells you well, something as that's, well. That's right. part of it, certainly. Um, I guess the, the question is, you know, part of the thinking on the internet, at least the conventional wisdom, if I have it right, was that the some people viewed it as a qualitatively different mm -hmm. technology based on its uh, mobility, mm -hmm. flexibility, portability, um, interactivity mm -hmm. compared to previous ways of technology. And seeing the sort of um, investment and efforts that are now coming from quarters that are seeking to shrink the space, mm -hmm. I just wonder, you know, wearing both your hat as a from the policy position, you had, but also the work you've done speaking to people on the ground, it, what's your sense of how the um, people looking to safeguard the internet mm -hmm. for its uh, for open communication and for coordination and for learning where their comrades are? What's your sense of how that's going to play out in the coming years? It's going to get harder and harder. You know, I think because, again, as the as we see more of these uprisings, as we see more of these uprisings where the Internet, you know, plays, it, plays a big role. I mean, look at Turkey. Turkey is an example. I mean, Turkey is now talking about kind of getting rid of Twitter and Facebook. Who knows what Russia is going to do? I mean, maybe that, that will be the next step. I mean, China doesn't seem like they're about to change their tune anytime soon. So, yeah, I think this this struggle. But I guess, you know, it's 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 never black and white. I mean, this is the dark side. But again, they wouldn't be doing this if the internet wasn't powerful. So that's really what it is. It's, it, and I think in, in a lot of these cases, the governments really are on the defensive. You know, they're sort of just catching on to this and they're saying like, oh, Twitter and Facebook are the source of our problems. Let's get rid of these, you know, these technologies. And, you know, again, at the risk of sounding like a techno optimist, you know, one thing I, I, I can say with a fair amount of confidence is that information always does find a way to get through. I've just have not seen any government with the exception of maybe North Korea and not, you know, really be able to completely control the flow of information in the internet age. It's just not really possible. And so there's varying degrees, you know, of, of course, and they're going to try really, really hard, but you know, it's, oh, it's, it's, this cat and mouse game is just going to go on, but it's not clear that the authorities, you know, hundred percent have the upper hand. I think, you know, I think that the vigorousness of their response is just testament to the internet's power. And I think the we have a bunch of questions. Why don't we do this? Um, start with Dan, and then we can work across. Thank you, uh, Dan Erickson with the State Department. I just bought the book. Congratulations, <laughs> Emily. I look forward to reading it. Um, since you profile so many different people in this, I was interested in learning a little more about the economics of being an internet dissident. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how do these people survive? Do they have day jobs? Are they making money online? Where do they actually purchase the equipment? How do yeah. they maintain access? I'm a little bit of familiar with a little familiar with the situation in Cuba, but I'm sure I could learn more on that too, but also in Russia and China. You okay, talk about so thanks, Dan. Dan is a Cuba expert. <laughs> um, you should also read Dan's book. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's a great, I mean, that's a great question. I think it, it completely varies. You know, in China's case, a lot of the early internet dissidents in China were kind of like these tech geeks, you know, people who kind of figured out how to get around the Great Firewall, and they were like pretty well educated, and they, you know, they, they were sort of like a certain stratum of society. But Cuba is an example of, I mean, the Cubans that are profiled in this book, like, have no money at all. I mean, that, so that that's an example of, like, how you can do this with, like, really lim limited economic means. So, like, one of the bloggers I talk about, Luritza, um, she's one of the main bloggers I profile. She came from, like, you know, I mean, really, she was completely poor. Her salary was ridiculous. I mean, she had she was living in almost like a 
like a shack. I mean, she had nothing. And so she, you know, initially, I think her first computer was like a donation from, from like an overseas NGO. And then, you know, she also had computers that she put together via the black market parts. And she like, put, you know, put it together in her house. Of course, she had no internet connection in her house. So what she would do is write on these kind of makeshift computers and then save her blog posts on a flash drive and then bring the flash drive to, you know, a hotel or an embassy. Embassies are free, hotels are not. So, you know, people have found a way around these economic problems. I mean, Q, Q, the, the economics question, I think, is most relevant in Cuba's case because economics really decide who has access to the internet or not. So you do have these cases of someone like Larissa or, you know, people who are creative. But for the most part, you know, the Cuban government limits access to the internet primarily by making it prohibitively expensive, right? I mean, if you, if people had enough money, because you can use the internet uh, in Cuban hotels and you can, but it's like $8 an hour or something like that. And now, you know, there was all this press about how, um, the Cuban authorities have put these 118 internet salons, you know, but those are something like 450 an hour, which is like a weekly wage for a Cuban. So I think in the Cuban situation, more than the other countries I saw, the economics were more at play. I mean, in China and Russia, the internet is pretty widely available. I didn't, you know, I, I didn't hear about that as much. Of course, like if you're out in the countryside or whatever, you know, if you're really poor, you're not going to have access to the internet, but it was less a pivotal part of the story as it is in, in Cuba. So, but but again, in Cuba, the economic thing, from what I saw, was pretty across the board. It's not like you had all these rich, privileged Cubans online and all these poor Cubans trying to get online. It was like most Cubans couldn't get online. That was more more of the issue. So. I know we had questions over here. Yep. Um, hi, my name is Dewey Huynh. Um I'm with Department of Homeland Security, but sort of just wandered here on my own because I was visiting somebody and I heard about this. So. <laughs> Um, Welcome. Not affiliated with them with this comment or anything. But um, being an engineer and everything, um, you're talking about the cat and mouse game. Uh, what new disrupted technology would you say that's in the process of being developed that will give one side the advantage over the other? Mm. Interesting. Well, there definitely are disruptive technologies being developed. Um, you know, there's some something that's happening at New America, which is called like, you know, the corrupt, what's it called? Commotion technology, you know, which which will sort of, is supposed to, I, I don't actually know that much about the technology about that, but that's like a theory where, you know, in theory, it's supposed to kind of allow you to get on the internet, you know, even if you don't have internet access. So in theory, that would work in a country like Cuba, you know, you can kind of bring the internet with you. I mean, there's all sorts of issues about if that's really going to work and, and if governments are going to crack down on that. I mean, in China, you know, there's always been ways I mean, you know, some of it isn't isn't particularly disruptive, but you know, there's proxy servers, virtual private networks. I mean, they've always found, and I guess like in some ways, something like a VPN is disruptive in the sense that I don't think China can ever do away with VPNs totally because they're needed by the financial sector. You know, so so I don't know. I mean, we're gonna sort of see, and then you know, there's been um, reports about Google encrypting their search. That's interesting. I don't know how that's going to play out. Google is starting to encrypt their search. So like in China, for example, if you're searching on Google, you know, it's harder for people to see what you're searching. So there are all these technological things that are happening. But in a country like China, for the most part, again, the government usually like responds to these pretty quickly. I haven't seen anything that's like totally invulnerable. Take the gentleman there. Mark Chatterjee from Safe Foundation. Um, you have an interesting title now, I know who my comrades are, uh, you almost uh, took, took away a name I would have liked to write a book on Edward Snowden because <laughs> I consider him my comrade, maybe not, uh, must, I must pick a name from the American Revolution probably. Now given that uh, and uh, being concerned about even this administration, and of course, this room is packed with government officials. I hate to say this. Um, uh, I guess Mr. Obama has violated every, everything that his manifesto had said, given that, and the Republicans don't want to impeach him. Uh, so is, isn't it time for people to now do that and uh, d use the internet to bring, bring him down and um, c create the same kind of revolution in this country? that we've seen in, in these other places. American Spring. <laughs> <laughs> so, I would say no. <laughs> um, you know, I think, I think one of, you know, just, you know, and your question raises a lot of important issues, too many of them to get into right now. I mean, this is, you know, this book really isn't about the states, it's about three other countries, but I would say that, like, 
one of the good things about the U.S. is that we do have a political system that can kind of like correct things and that you can, if you don't like Obama, then you can vote him out of power. You know, I mean, I think the problem with a lot of the countries that I talk about, it's like it's like revolution or not. You know, that's their only option. And I'm optimistic that we have other ways for correcting things in this country without, you know, revolution in the streets. So. Two parties who are really being taken down. Mm. The <laughs> was there one other question here? Yeah. Hello. Uh, my name is Molly Schwartz. I'm from the State Department. I, as you mentioned, the internet is a tool just like any other form of media. And part of its power is that it's distributed, but that's also part of the danger. Because mm -hmm. as your, the title of your book suggests, now I know who my comrades are. But we were re referring to the bots in Russia and things like that. Have you seen circumstances in your research where people were really effective in determining authenticity on the internet where there was no context? And if so, what were the characteristics of those? And also, if we're talking about trying to combat the um, false narratives going on in the Russian media right now, what are your suggestions for how to do that? <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, so actually that's a really good question about bots. Um, you know, this whole idea of now I know who my comrades are. I mean, this and this is, it's not just Russia and China too and all these countries, you kind of have like either fake people, like literally bots, you know, coming on and saying like, you know, pro-government stuff. Or in China, you have the kind of notorious, called the 50 cent party, you know, they supposedly get 50 cents for every kind of pro-government post. You always have these forces online of people pretending to be other things or trying to influence the conversation. Um, I mean, I guess like the one thing I would say, and maybe this is a gross, overgeneralization, but I, I think some of these are quite limited in their effectiveness. You know, I think you tend, th this question always comes up. It's like, well, what about the bots and what about the 50 cent party? And, you know, most Chinese bloggers or, or people I've talked to, they can recognize those, those forces pretty quickly. They're pretty obvious and pretty heavy handed. They sort of speak a different language, you know? I mean, I mean, they literally speak the same language, but they kind of, it just doesn't quite work. And th this would happen in Russia all the time. I mean, you'd get these commenters and, you know, th there's one, um, one, one part of the Russia section takes place in Siberia, and there's a Siberian blogger who's causing all this trouble, and he's, you know, getting all these comments on his blog, and, you know, some one of the comments, you know, these pro-government things, but he can see the IP addresses of the commenters, and one of them goes back to, like, a Siberian police station. So, but he kind of knew immediately, and you can look at the comment and be like, that seems weird. So, but in terms of um, people fighting bots, in Russia, actually, Navalny has definitely tried to launch a war on bots, because, you know, as is often the case in Russia, you know, they do things like in such grand style in terms of conspiracy theories like it's never a simple conspiracy it's like a really complicated conspiracy so like I heard a story once where Navalny this is actually really great Navalny's office told me that at one point his blog or something was inundated by like pro Navalny bots but that was actually some sort of like Kremlin operation to make it look as if Navalny had hired pro Navalny bots for himself. <laughs> like do you know what I mean it's like it's mind blowing you're like well I can't even keep track of it so so Russia it's like a bot inside a bot inside another bot so you know one of the things that um Navalny and his people try to do, and I, they've had limited success with this, but they tried to do like electronic signatures, you know, because they were doing a lot of online voting. So they were trying to do a way that like, you know, could kind of fight the, the, the bot invasion. And it's actually really interesting because in, in the US, we talk so much about privacy online, but in Russia, the conversation is really different because like anonymity online in Russia is a really big problem because, you know, it's actually there, they spend a lot of time trying to verify people's identity. So it's, it's kind of a different conversation. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's always an issue, so. I get the sense that it's, uh, it's this um, function of provocateurs or others participating mm -hmm. most essentially inauthentic participation yeah. has really had the effect of muddying the waters more so than guiding the debate. It can, it can, and like, I mean, the bots can also cause a lot of problems. I mean, just if there's like tons of them on a Russian blog, it can cause a lot of problems technologically. But I, just in, you know, again, this is an overgeneralization. I, I don't think that the fake people on the internet, they're usually not that effective. I, I haven't seen that many instances of where they've like actually been effective at like guiding conversation from one way to another, or like tricking people or, you know, they're usually pretty, pretty silly. That might change, but. I think we're just about out of time. We might have a chance for a couple of more questions if they're there. Why don't we take the three that are here? Why, if we can do them together, and then if you Sure. Wanna... Hi, uh, Mike Crump from IRI. Um, I think you can have uh, an interesting comparison when you look at the, uh, the China and the Cuba context in terms of whether, um, whether internet 
fame, for lack of a better term, protects you or makes you less safe uh, in your research, do you think one of those will turn out to be the prevalent uh, narrative? I think you could make a case for either. Uh, and if so, which narrative? And if so, how will that affect netizens in uh, the countries of the competing narrative? And then we'll go to James. Thank you. Hi, my name is Daniel Pedrera. I'm with the Center for Free Cuba. And going back on the question on Venezuela, I just wanted to, I mean, I know you didn't look at it in depth, but I just wanted to get an idea of where what's going on now in Venezuela would fit into your kind of vision of, of these issues. And then take the last question from James. Uh, my name is James Chen. I'm the founder of the China Reporter Foundation, a nonprofit to promote press freedom in China. Uh, I have a two questions. One is about the um, economy of internet. Um, you know that there are huge internet companies in China which are listed in the uh, U.S., mm -hmm. and, um, but they play a critical role uh, in censor and deleting those posters, as you observe very well in your book. And I'm sure they're not comrades of the internet users. At the same time, the Chinese government realized the importance of the internet, and with 600 million users now, and Chinese President Xi just appointed himself as the internet security leader now, mm -hmm. perhaps the only one in the world that the head of the state taking that role. So what do you vision the future, um, the virtual <laughs> online future for the citizen uh, netizen, the internet users in China. Thank well, you for that. the government, of course, they won't try to control that. Mm -hmm. we, we know that. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, first question about if internet fame makes you less safe or more vulnerable, and which trend? Uh, yeah, uh, more or less safe. More or less safe. So, that's a t you know, I always feel like, I, I never want to say like, oh, it makes you safe because then one of these people is going to get arrested and, and I'm going to feel horrible. Um, you know, I think, I think, in a lot of these, in these countries, I mean, internet fame, I mean, you look at, again, like someone like Navalny, um, I think the reason, you know, Navalny was arrested and then they kind of suspended his sentence. And I think it was because, you know, thousands of people were protesting. And I think there's just that headache factor for governments. You know, it's not like they see the error of their ways, but they're like, is this really worth it? Is this one guy really worth it, you know, for us to have all this international criticism? And, you know, so I think in, in that case, I think the domestic pressure did play some role. You know, in, 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 in places like Cuba, I do think that, the Cuban government is somewhat sensitive to the international response. And if there's going to be a huge international uproar over some random blogger, it's not worth it to them. However, you know, Alan Gross is still in jail in Cuba. Um, he was trying to bring in kind of communications equipment. He was a contractor for the U.S. government. So I guess the, the thing is, is like for the most part, I think fame is, is helpful, but there is always that line. And it's a little bit dangerous because there's always that one person that you're like, they would never arrest that, that person. And sometimes, you know, in China, when they arrested Ai Weiwei, I think Ai Weiwei was like an example of like, they will never touch him. You know, Ai Weiwei just seemed like a battle not worth fighting because he's so famous abroad. He has so many supporters. And, you know, I think when they arrested Ai Weiwei, it was kind of right after the Arab Spring. And I think the message they were trying to send was, you know, any of you could be next. So sometimes, you know, I think people will arrest a really famous blogger just to be like, we'll even arrest that guy. So imagine what would happen to you. So it's a, it's a, it's a tough question. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I'm hoping it will help make them more safe. So. And, oh, Venezuela. So, yeah, I really, I'm not an expert in Venezuela. The people in this room are, so I feel like <laughs> it's probably a bad idea for me to opine <laughs> about Venezuela. I guess the only thing that I've observed in Venezuela that's that's kind of in in sync with what's happening all over the world is the government crackdown on, on the internet, you know, and that's, and that's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out. I mean, you know, we've really seen uh, Venezuela like, actively going after the internet, and in most cases, I mean, you would know better than me, and I'm happy to talk to you about it after, but it seems that it hasn't really worked. I mean, I could be wrong about that, but it doesn't look like, you know, Venezuela's crackdown on the Internet has really helped stem the protests. I mean, the protests are still kind of raging on. So the question for me, what's really an interesting question for me is, like, will it have the adverse effect that it had in Egypt, for example? Like, will Internet crackdown in Venezuela actually make the people make people more furious? So that, that's what I want to see. And in Venezuela, it may be more of a challenge because the society already has more... 
political participation and yeah. competition. Than it's in... it's really hard to take away the internet. You know, it's one thing if you've never had internet to begin with, but that's something that, that, that that's the difference between Russia and China. You know, China, came, the internet came to China in a limited way. In Russia, people had a pretty free internet and then the authorities are trying to change that. I don't know where Venezuela fits on that spectrum, but I would say it's probably closer to Russia than China in that like, you know, if we see a really... I don't know, a really fierce crackdown on the internet in Venezuela, I think some people are going to think that something was was taken away from them. So. And was there one more question? I don't think so. China. 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 Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Um, where is China going um, in terms of internet? I mean, I don't know. I, I guess the only thing I would say is that... that <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, if I could predict what happens in China, I would be making a lot more money than I am. Um, but... I guess like the really simple question, it's simple answer to that question is that the internet is not going away in China. It's going to change forms many times. I mean, maybe Weibo will eventually disappear and we take it over by WeChat and then maybe WeChat will disappear and we'll take it be taken over by something else. But this is like, this is a force that I just, I just don't think they can ever totally take it away. And I think it's something that the government is just, it's just become a part of life in China. And I think there's just going to be this constant balance of like how to deal with it. And yeah, I mean, I think like there are ways that the, the internet does help the government in China for sure. I mean, it helps them like gather information and like that's an argument that you hear sometimes that like the internet in China is just some sort of pressure valve, right? And it's a way for people to say things and it's a way for the government to know what people are saying. And like that's true to a certain extent, but I would argue that kind of like the psychological power of it probably overrides that negative aspect. Well, that's a hopeful note. And yeah. maybe we'll use that one to, uh, to end on. I just, I'd like to really express my thanks. Emily, you went beyond the call of duty. I think you got questions on the countries you covered in the book and many <laughs> others and policy related and otherwise. It was just great. And Christian, thank you very much for chiming thank in you. and helping. And thanks to all of you for your questions. Thank Hope you so you much. Soon.